And so, welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, <laughs> I thought I'd, I thought we'd do something new, <laughs> new tonight. And so <laughs> I thought we would discuss the Bodhisattva Akshayamati Sutra. I, you know, <laughs> a little, <laughs> a little change of pace. Um, but seriously, though, we're going to continue tonight. You may notice it's the same whiteboard we'd have we've had for a few Sundays now, and so this is going to be a continuation of our conversation discussion about samadhi. This word down here, samadhi, concentration. Although tonight, just to let you know. Tonight, our definition of samadhi tonight is single pointed awareness. It's, it's a common translation or it's one of the many translations. So tonight we're going to be talking about single pointed awareness as a starting point for understanding samadhi. Um, so we're going to talk about samadhi more tonight. Uh, this is going to be a continuation then of last week, the week before, maybe even the week before that. I forget how long we've been talking about samadhi. Um, and I'm going to start tonight off with a, 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 a late development, a late minute development in this. <clears throat> and and it, it's funny, it's funny I should even put it that way. Because what I mean is, is that I already mentioned to you that if you were to move outside of Buddhism, right, if you were to move into the larger world of, oh, Indian religion, call it Hinduism, if you were to move into the broader world of yoga, call it Raja yoga, call it Ashtanga yoga, call it Asamkhya yoga, call it, you know, you name it. Outside of Buddhism, all of these traditions, the yoga tradition, a big part of the Hindu tradition, it all actually kind of culminates in samadhi. <laughs> like this is, the, this is the end of the line. This is it, samadhi. And when we shift gears and start talking about Buddhism, <clears throat> I mentioned, of course, how could you not? I mentioned the Noble Eightfold Path in which the eighth last final step of the Noble Eightfold Path is Samadhi. Yes, right Samadhi, Samyak Samadhi, the right Samadhi, but nonetheless, the end of the road is Samadhi. And so this sort of late development or this sort of uh, idea that just occurred to me before we started the, the class tonight was how in the context of this sutra that we have been looking at and looking at week after week after week, we've, we've, we, it's been a long journey is my point. We've gone through initiations and generations for enlightenment, we've gone through paramitas, we've gone through stages, we've had visions, <laughs> like all of this stuff has happened. And now the sutra begins to talk about these 10 samadhis of the bodhisattva. And again, it was sort of just a, a last minute realization of my own, where I was like, oh, how interesting that these samadhis are coming at basically the end of the sutra. So these are still the culmination of this. I say all of that as a grand introduction to this installment of our, of our discussion of samadhis by saying that when we are talking about samadhi, when we are in samadhi, when when it's about samadhi, we're at the end of the road here. I mean, yeah, there's another list of 10 things coming, but don't worry about that. This is, so, <laughs> I, uh, I joke, but my, my point is, is that the sutra has 
brought us all the way to this point. And indeed, samadhis are, they're serious business. That's what I'm trying to say. This is like, like end of the road, serious kind of business kind of stuff. And so I, I, I say all of that to remind us that we are talking about this, this, I mean, I don't want to call it a culmination or a, you know, any kind of end. I don't want to put any kind of teleological connotations to it. But the idea here is, is that this is a very, um, it's a tricky idea, I guess, is what has, has come out through all of these discussions so far, is that because this is such a end of the road idea, and I, I, I guess I would, this might be the very reason. I haven't been to the end of the road, frankly, personally. I don't know if, if anybody here has been to the end of the road. And so discussing the end of the road is tricky when you haven't been to the end of the road in that way. That's kind of what I mean about this Samadhi business is that it, it's so subtle, very, I would imagine subjective in a way in terms of what these experiences mean to each of us, what they feel like, uh, all of these ideas. And, and actually what I'm getting at, what, what this is all getting to is it's a note, it's a note to myself that I have from last week. So after each Dharma doors, I sit down and write out a bunch of notes as far as, so I don't forget where we're at in our conversation here. And the one note I had from last week from which all of this is, is coming is the question of, <laughs> at least in my notes, it says Samadhi, eyes open or eyes closed? That's my note to myself. That's my one mnemonic trigger for this whole Dharma talk. Does one achieve Samadhi with their eyes open or their eyes closed? <clears throat> and I mean that sort of figuratively and all, all kinds of ways. So in the basic way, I, I, I had that note to, to me, that note reminds me, it's a mnemonic and it reminds me <clears throat> to address the idea of meditation. I don't want us to forget that we're talking about meditation. If anybody for, if for some wild reason is just joining this conversation right now, <laughs> I want to remind you, I want to tell you that we're talking about meditation for whatever that word is worth. And I actually thought uh, just now, that it would be fun to remind us of, I, yeah, you can't just dive into a conversation about samadhi. You can't just do, I tried, I tried really hard, but it just didn't work. So here's the deal. I want to remind us that we're talking about these meditative states. It's where my note to myself, eyes opened or eyes closed. It's where this comes from. What kind of meditative state is this? And so in order to get back to our 10 samadhis of the bodhisattva, I want to just very quickly bring us to the precipice, right up to the edge of samadhi. And then we'll talk about what might be right past that. <clears throat> but I want to remind you of what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about mindfulness versus mindlessness. So mindfulness versus mindlessness. And the way that I understand <clears throat> either of those, the way that I understand mindfulness is that it's not mindless. And to me, mindless, the way that I think of it, and this is just going to be my subtle introduction to this idea of meditation, is a way to, from the way that I think of mindfulness is that I always think of my mind 
as this sort of um, almost like a pie chart of attention and all of the different things that I'm giving attention to get a little slice of the pie of my attention. And so for me to come into mindfulness, I reflect on the way in which my mind and I'm being very personal here. I'm not actually telling you about what's in a sutra. I'm not telling you about what the Buddha said. I'm telling you what M Michael Owens does to think about mindfulness and meditation is I recognize the aspects of my mind that are in the past that are not actually in May, uh, Red Day, whatever day it is, uh, 2021, whatever thoughts are in the past, like yesterday or earlier or whatever, I, I try to acknowledge that a portion of my thinking is stuck in the past. Equally, I recognize that there's a chunk of my mind, my attention that is in the future. It's future oriented. It's thinking about later on tonight. It's thinking about later on in my life. It's thinking about these obligations, these responsibilities I have, right? And so for me, part of the mindfulness practice is about recognizing that the past and the present, or sorry, the past and the future are not present. They are, they are not here. They are kind of imaginary in a way. And so in order to establish mindfulness, just med a meditative state, let's say, I sort of let go of or try to let go of past and future and just try to establish my mind in the present. And even when one realizes and can distinguish the present from the imaginations of the past and the imaginations of what will come, when one's established in the present, one realizes, oh, even present time awareness is tricky because I have present time awareness of what is right in front of me, but I'm also aware of the other rooms in my house I'm aware of the street noise outside the, my, the door. So I'm aware of presence, but not what is actually present right here. And so a further way to meditate in that sense of establishing mindfulness is to not just let go of past and future, but even in terms of the present, to really only be attending what is in one's purview, what is actually in one's line of sight, line of smell, auditory and otherwise. And then even if you're there and you've let go of the past and the future and everything that is outside of your purview, you can begin to recognize a lot of emotional layers, let's call it, emotional layers to the experience of right now. And so through a variety of techniques, the premier technique are the four foundations of mindfulness, establishing awareness of the breath, meaning the body, and then sensations of the body, and then mind states, and then ultimately dharmas, truths, but those four foundations of mindfulness are all about, again, stripping away past and future, stripping away what is not present, and then even stripping away and disambiguating emotional feelings from just experience experience of phenomena. <clears throat> and what I'm getting at is, is that all of this process, if you haven't noticed, it's about gathering and bringing in one's attention. We started frayed, right? F like uh, 
frayed, right? Like uh, just distracted in all kinds of different ways, in many different ways, because of course we have emotional feelings about the past. We have emotional feelings about the future. We have emotional feelings about that which is outside our purview. So there's a lot to get rid of just to become established in present time awareness. All right. So now here we are in present time awareness. And again, to the degree that which we have been able to separate out emotional reactions to phenomena, to the degree to which we are actually just present with phenomena, the phenomena of, the, of being embodied, the phenomena of seeing forms and hearing forms and all of this, that if one is able to completely sort of, and this is where it gets tricky because I don't want to say anything definitive, but if one is able to really kind of remove the emotional responses to phenomena and is able to really just sort of encounter phenomena that is, again, phenomena that is present, not imaginations, but a present phenomena, then one sort of, and actually, if you were really, really in there, then you are in what is called a dionic state or a jhana or a dhyana. And I say this to remind everyone that there is this layer of emotionality that can be temper, <clears throat> excuse me, tempered and can be ultimately sort of set on the side so as to just experience what is called the realm of pure form. Not the Kama Datu, not the realm of desires and the way things we would like it to be and the way things we wished it would be and all of that, but actual just this present time awareness of phenomena as phenomena as these like, you know, nothing to get emotional about, but actual just occurrences in that way. And the idea is, is that if you, if you would like a, 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 uh, a signpost, if you would like a little roadmap right now in the world of Dhyana, and we're, by the way, we're heading towards Samadhi, of course, but right now we're in a kind of more dionic state. And in so far as we're in a dionic state, dionic states happen just within the realm of form. And a helpful reminder, a signpost here is that the realm of form is seeing phenomena in terms of earth, water, fire, and air seeing phenomena in terms of its solidity, fluidity or liquidity, its temperature and its movement. Those are the four great elements, by the way, not dirt and H2O water and fire and air. Those four elements, if you have not heard this, it's very, very good to know, especially for meditators. It is very helpful to know that the four elements, they're just a way of seeing this world, a very basic way of seeing the things of this world, the phenomena of this world. And it's seeing the phenomena of this world just in terms of how solid it is, how dense it is, let's say versus how liquid or fluid it is versus what temperature something is because everything has a temperature even if it's very cold or very hot it has a temperature and things are moving or they're not or they're moving maybe a little bit and the idea is, is that that fourth element, the air element, is about animation, 
<clears throat> it's about life. It's about things moving all on their own, like a plant. A plant, a vine, a vine will reach. <laughs> a vine will reach and grab. And a, a vine will reach and grab and tear down. I mean, it, vines are wild. And so vines have movement. Vines have liquid. They have various fluids flowing through the leaves and the stalk and the, the stem. Plants have a temperature. They have a heat element. And plants are partially solid. So what is a plant? Yes, you could see it as a chrysanthemum or as a this or as a that, and you could have a name and all of this crazy ideas. Or you could see something in terms of its elemental makeup, how solid it is, and how liquid it is, and its temperature, and its movement. And there's actually a way for the meditator to move through this world seeing everything strictly in terms of those four elements. <clears throat> I want to remind you that that's a very, very interesting way to observe the body, which is in terms of its solid portions, the flesh, ooh, the bone, right? The skull, the, the bones, they're so dense. It's such earth element. But your blood, right? And the snot and the effluvia, it's all so liquid. It's not like the bones. Oh, so you're part bone, earth element. You're part blood and pus. You're part liquid element you are much warmer than a lot of other things in the room. Yes, you have a temperature, you have a heat element, you have a high, a very high heat element, and you're moving all around and breathing and respirating. So what is a human being? <clears throat> There's a way to look at, at a human being in terms of its relationship to other species. There's ways of looking at human beings in terms of a bunch of stuff. But there's also a way of looking at a human being in terms of the four elements, just in terms of the four elements. Oh, wow, you're a really hot, solid, liquid moving thing, aren't you? And what I'm, I'm hoping all the Dharma heads in the room are, are totally vibing how equanimous that would be to view all phenomena strictly in terms of these four elements, right? And by the way, again, I, just in case I didn't make it clear, if this four element way of thinking seems arcane, right, to you, ancient and arcane, I just want you to know that like a periodic table of elements that moves from gases all the way down to the heavy, heavy metals is a chart of density. It's a chart of how, how closely packed in all those atoms are, all those new, you know, and so it's, a, it's actually a chart of the earth element in the sense of density. And so this way of thinking or this way of seeing the world, it's not arcane at, at all. It's just not our normal way of seeing the world, which is this more uh, stripped of emotionality and strictly elemental in that way. So if I, if I did my job properly, <laughs> I've tried to bring us conceptually at least from this sort of really chaotic a frame of mind where the mind is split and divided in so many different ways. It's not even funny between past and future and emotionality about all of that and all of that. And as you bring it all in, right? Meaning, yeah, past, let it go, future, let it go. That which is outside of one's purview, let it go. 
totally being present, but then aware that whatever is present is causing emotionality. And so being aware of that emotionality, eventually putting that emotionality on the side in order to just observe phenomena for and phenomena's sake. That's dhyana. That's the realm of jhana or dhyana. It's a very cool, clear, unemotional way of seeing the world. And from all accounts, it's a very oh liberative way of seeing the world it's a very freeing way of seeing the world is everybody okay yeah 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 i just uh, found yeah. find it interesting you know neuroscience and what they discovered that um that um the mind or the brain um can't distinguish between the experience of what is right in front of you or what happened in the past. And that's what I found really interesting in the context. Um, I, I hear you, I, I know what you're talking about and equally, yeah. I mean, I was gonna just say, you know, equally interesting of course are those um, studies where they've taken children to a virtual, like a, an immersive virtual experience of swimming with whales. And then years later said, do you remember when you swam with the whales? And they're like, oh yeah. And they remember it as if it was a real event. That it wasn't virtual in their mind, in their memory. It was like, no, I got wet, swam around. And that's, that's interesting as far as the mind works, but I don't want to, Go derail us too much in that way. Yeah, no. Yeah, I don't want to derail us in this way either, but I just today I heard uh, a teacher talking about five elements and the fifth was space. And I, I'd never heard that way of talking about it before. So without going too far afield. <laughs> no, no, and I appreciate the comment because other uh, people have probably heard that as well. It is very common in, mm, most, most schools of Buddhism, but it is actually a Vajrayana idea, just F FYI. In the later schools of Buddhism, such as the Vajrayana, they do include Akasha or space as a fifth element. And I'm not a huge, the biggest fan of that just because Akasha it has such a special place among elemental theory that to cram it in with the other four, I think it's tricky. Um, there's actually even a sixth element and all of that. It gets really wild, but um, just be it known that that's a later development. Yeah. And that traditionally the four elements are in contrast to space in that way. Uh, that's how you've taught it as sort of a the, yeah. the what affords the other things to arise or something so, exactly thank you yeah. okay so now that we have um gone through that process i i feel like i've i've done my part <laughs> to address that process that like so what are we talking about with samadhi well we're talking about a meditative state so we are not talking about a state of mindlessness, distraction. We are not talking about a mind that is divided between past, present, and future. We are talking about a very focused mind. All right. So I don't, you know, all from the yogis to the Vajrayana people, everybody, a samadhi is a very focused state of mind. That is for sure. All right. Now, the reason why I kind of brought you through that journey and tried to establish this relationship between emotionality, which has sort of kind of been code for desire, the kamadatu, the realm of desire, this idea of like things getting us worked up, right? So that's been set aside, as I have said. And now we're sort of, if we are in a dhyana or a jhanic state, we are in a state that is just operating in terms of pure form, just solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement. 
like real basic, basic things, which by the way, if I didn't make this clear, you can still distinguish a flower from the stem, from a tractor, from everything else. So seeing, seeing the world in terms of the four elements by no means makes you blind to what's going on. In many ways, actually, you now have x-ray vision because you are seeing things strictly in terms of these elemental proportions, the proportion of solidity to liquidity, to temperature, to movement. And indeed, anything that you could look at can be understood in terms of its that relationship. So this is not, um, again, it's not a dull state of mind. It's a very sharp, clear state of mind, actually. And I, I say all of this because I'm leading us towards my, the note to myself, does one achieve samadhi with their eyes open or their eyes closed? And I, I mean that sort of literally, like literally, do you have your eyes closed and you attain samadhi and then when you open them, you're out of samadhi? Like, is that literally how it works? And I also mean it figuratively eyes open or eyes closed. And what I mean by it when I say figuratively is, is that I, I want to uh, talk about this idea of, is samadhi like just a meditative experience or is it actually something that is like seen? Like, is it just a, a, good, a good feeling? Or is it an, an actual perceptive shift? Like what's going, because what I'm getting at is, is that when the first samadhi of the bodhisattva is the samadhi of jewels manifesting, how could I not think of that visually, right? How could I not sort of literally see that? And so that is where my note comes uh, from for this uh, talk tonight, which is like, so what are, what are these samadhis? And I'm certainly, I'm going to keep doing what I always do, which is not give you an answer. I do not want to say anything definitive in that way. I think that would be not as cool, frankly. But the idea here is, is, you know, the, the problem here, not even what the idea is, the, the, the problem is, is that there's a lot of different sources for information on these samadhis. And in, according to some sources, according to some sources, it's, you, are, you would seemingly be definitely outside of the visual experience. You would be outside of, of that. And I say that because you know, I, I did a little preliminary work here uh, in these previous sessions preparing us for this talk. If you remember, according to some traditions, samadhi is like union with the divine. It's like being swept up to heaven and being like in strongly embraced by God or something. So the idea is, is that if samadhi is understood as a state of union, a state of oneness, <clears throat> in particular, a non-dual state in which there is no longer subject and object, then the idea of seeing something is off the table by logical definition, by every, it's like, yeah, you, you're telling me I'm not doing it this, this way anymore. Subject, object, me, Michael, seeing whatever I'm seeing. It's, it's totally different in Samadhi. So that might be the easy answer to the question. Samadhi with eyes open, eyes closed, no eyes. They, they're not open or closed. That might actually open, <laughs> I actually might raise more questions than it answers in that sense. But it, I'm trying to push us towards 
a um i'm trying to push us towards kind of a a real respect for what samadhi is it's not just a, a good meditation and it, or it might be it might be for you but what i'm saying is is that the definitions of this are not just like a good meditation they're kind of like it's about a like a life altering experience in a way because everything has kind of been really radically shifted in that sense so yeah so let's kind of like keep all of that in mind i i am starting to slowly move us towards <laughs> back to our discussion of these 10 samadhis but i wanted to like clearly establish before we even talk about these 10 i wanted to really clearly establish that this is a a meditative state this is not a state of mindlessness. This is a state of focused awareness. Great. It is a state that is, by all accounts, it is a state that is beyond the subject-object relationship, the dualistic relationship. Remember, when I was just talking about dhyana, or jhana, and I was talking about jhanic states, and the idea that these jhanic states are sort of taking place strictly in a realm of pure form, in which you're observing phenomena, but just in terms of the four elements. In fact, you're even observing your own body, but just in terms of the four elements. They're still an observer of an observed. There's still a subject object relationship and so i have yet to really find descriptions of dhyana in which there is not a subject object relationship in that way even frankly all the descriptions of upeksha equanimity the fourth dhyanic state they are still described in terms of subject object in a way they are still described as a state of equanimity towards <laughs> X, Y, or Z. What it, yeah, bring it, bring it, bring it. I'm equanimous. So there's still a sense of subject object. Whereas within the land of samadhis, there seems to be something different going on regarding the subject object relationship. And I'm, I'm saying all of this now to get us ready to talk about these 10 samadhis and how they might be experienced but experienced beyond the subject object relationship. Yeah. Okay. Pausing for any last minute questions, comments or answers or ideas or epiphanies before we get back to our Bodhisattva Kshayamati. Awesome. Okay. Um, be, uh, as an entree to these 10, <clears throat> there was another idea or question that came up last time that I want to address. And I want to talk about it now. Yeah, I want to talk about it now because it's going to come up again shortly. So this beautiful sutra that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks, the reason why I chose it originally, I said, was it's this very, it's the whole Bodhisattva path in the very, very small sutra. And that's not easy to find. <laughs> Usually the Bodhisattva path is articulated in hundreds and hundreds of pages. And so to find a nice little sutra that says it all is good. And so part of that Bodhisattva path is it has to do with generating the initial determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. We talked about this last time. I'm not going to get too into it this time. But it's this idea that there are these 10 initiations, these 10 start startups of what is called bodhicitta. That's this word. This is what the bodhisattva wants to know about. How do you become enlightened? How do you develop an enlightened mind? The Buddha said from the beginning, these 10 initiations, how do you, how do you do these 10 initiations? Well, each of the initiations 
is related to one of the paramitas, generosity, moral discipline, patience, determination or drive, meditation, wisdom, skillful means, power, devotion, and knowledge. So these are these 10 observations or practices that if you, if you do them, that's the initiation of the, the, this initial generation of bodhicitta or the mind of enlightenment. By doing that, one heads off on the bodhisattva path and one will eventually come to abide in these 10 stages of bodhisattvahood each with their own cool Sanskrit name that has this cool meaning. And not only that, but in making these 10 initiations or generations of enlightenment, by doing the 10 paramitas, right before a bodhisattva is about to abide in each of these 10 stages, they will have a vision, 10 visions, right before they abide in each of these 10 stages. By the way, once a bodhisattva is established in each of these stages, they complete or perfect that paramita. And not only that, but the bodhisattva who makes that initial determination based on doing that paramita in order to have the vision, in order to come to that stage, will, upon making that initial determination, they will have a succession of 10 samadhis. So that's a quick summary <clears throat> of how these all fit together. And so when the bodhisattva initiates this generation of bodhicitta for the first time by practicing generosity or dana, they abide in this samadhi called kind of jewels appearing everywhere, jewels manifesting, treasures manifesting. And it co this corresponds to the first vision that a bodhisattva has of seeing the whole universe filled with jewels, right? And this first initiation of enlightenment that culminates, or I shouldn't say culminate, but develops this samadhi, they, they come to abide in this stage of great joy, pramudita. If they generate it again, right? They're like, I'm going to go for the second generation. I'm going to, you know. And so the second generation of enlightenment by way of practicing moral discipline, watching what you say, avoiding lying, harsh speech, divisive speech, malicious speech, avoiding taking what is not given, avoiding violence, harm, and killing. Through moral discipline, one, well, one eventually abides in this second samadhi that is called well-abiding. So that second samadhi, well abiding. The, I mean, it's a real, it, you know, I have avoided spending an entire night on each of these, which I very well could have done. Um, I, I, it seems like I'm going for spending 10 nights on all of them, is what it seems like I'm doing. Um, we'll find out. But the idea is, is that I, I actually have kept, I keep using a word. Buddhists keep using a word. And the word is abide, to abide. Yeah. And the idea is, is that this abiding is sort of a code word for meditation. And so in the second 
stage of bodhisattvahood, this stage, the stage that is, so the stage that is correlated with moral discipline is the stage that's called vimala, stainless, flawless, totally perfect in that way. That's vimala. And that stage, well, the point is, is that each of these stages, the bodhisattva abides in those stages. If you were meditating, and if you were meditating along with me, and you were actually able to abandon past and future, and actually able to abandon emotionality in that way, and just came to the realm of form, like a nice geonic state, you would be abiding in the realm of form, no longer abiding in the realm of desire, but abiding in the realm of form. So this samadhi that the bodhisattva reaches in correlation with the second stage and the second paramita and all of that, this samadhi is called well abiding. And I mean, that one, it's one of those ones that it, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it doesn't entirely speak to samadhi like the next one. So the next one we're going to get to is the immovable samadhi. And that's going to be very uh, samadhi. It's going to be very one unity in that way. But the idea of well abiding, the real, like for me, and this is interpretive, I've said it from the beginning. I don't know what any of these samadhis or visions or any of these things really mean in that way. But for me, when I put the idea of well abiding within the world of Buddhism, for me, what well abiding implies is this beautiful, beautiful state of total contentment, absolute tranquility, but even more than tranquil and peaceful and blissful or all of that, it's actually about this idea of content. It's this idea of, of in, not in need of anything well abiding in and and well well makes it sound like you're good at it but it's not that you're good at it it's that it's that that this is all you would need is to abide meaning to be in a meditative state that's all i would need if you could even call that a need in that sense and so this is if 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 i could give you like if, if I could try to impart a, a feeling, I would suggest considering that as we go up the ladder here, as we go up these samadhis, they're gonna get more and more, I don't wanna say intense or anything like that, but there's going to be a, 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 a growth of some sort as we go up here. And so, the next stage is going to be immovable, totally immovable. The idea of well abiding is right before that idea of immovable. And it's this idea of just like, you don't, you don't got to go anywhere. It's not that you couldn't. Immovable will be where, where you, there's nowhere you could go. You all are already everywhere. But right before immovable is this, I don't need to go anywhere. That's for me, the idea of a, this, a samadhi that is well abiding. It's this very peaceful, tranquil, content state in which there is no movement outwards in grasping, no movement in recoiling, no movement in, in terms of aversion, no movement in terms of confusion or delusion. So no traces of the three poisons in that way. And so there is just this content state of well abiding as a samadhi. 
Tanya, you had an uh, idea? I was just, uh, I, can you, if you remember, what was the, what was the vision going into the second one again? Ooh. Do you remember? I do. So the vision that we were had going into this was about seeing the whole world, the whole universe actually, as if it were in the palm of your hand in a way, and it was covered or adorned, I should say, in beautiful lotus flowers. If I may, I wanna take just one step back to the jewel-filled world. That was the vision. The first vision was a jewel-filled world. Everything is a jewel. Think about that. Just put that on for a second as it pertains to this paramita of generosity and giving. And in particular, of course, when you're thinking about generosity and giving, think about value, the, you know, and this idea. And so there's a way in which that first vision of the bodhisattva who has become a bodhisattva by practicing giving, there's a way in which it's, it's a vision of, oh, wow, I could give this all away. <laughs> These, there's jewels everywhere for everybody. There's so much merit to be made, right? So that's sort of this initial bodhisattva vision. The second one is a very more subdued in that way, the well abiding that corresponds to moral discipline. This idea of, of being, again, it's sort of about wanting or being averse to things and the idea of moral discipline and vimala is coming to this very well it, it all of these samadhis are going to be about equanimity so it, it's it'll be actually about trying to find the equanimity in each of these and for the second one of well abiding the equanimity is about this idea of not needing not needing to go anywhere not wanting to go anywhere well abiding. The third samadhi, as I've already mentioned, is the samadhi of this immovable. This is achala. Achala is a very big idea in Buddhism. Uh, achala is even one of the 10 stages. Achala is the stage, the eighth bhumi stage is the stage of immovability. This is just a samadhi of immovability, right? So I, I suppose you could imagine that the Bodhisattva gets a little taste of immovability here in the third stage, but is not fully established in immovability until the eighth stage. I suppose that's how you could read it. This third samadhi, achala, immovability, the immovable samadhi comes about, we are to understand, by making the third generation, the third determination for unsurpassed, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment by way of the paramita of patience, kshanti. So kshanti, the, I often, always, always like to mention that the root of this word kashanti is just shanti, peace. You may know the chant, om shanti, 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 om peace, peace, peace. So shanti is peace. Kashanti is patience, peacefulness. In fact, you can even see and notice that the word patience is patience. It's about pacification peaceification, right? <clears throat> so here you go. So the third samadhi, the immovable samadhi, that is, <clears throat> if we read the text uh, correctly, the third samadhi is brought about by making this third determination for enlightenment that is based on this third paramita of kashanti. And if you wanted to know how that all might fit together. There's two, 
two things I want to mention about this. One is sort of uh, anecdotal, I would say, and, and the other is a little more philosophical. The anecdotal reference to immovability and kashanti. How does immovability and kashanti match up? How do those relate? Well, I want to remind you of the premier example of kashanti. The premier number one example of kashanti. If you ever want to know what kashanti is, always refer back to that famous story of the Buddha before he became the Buddha. It is a former life of the Buddha. This is what is called a Jataka tale. And in this particular Jataka tale, the Buddha was a wandering ascetic living in the woods. And this wandering ascetic living in the woods, meditating, practicing, well, it's a long story that I won't get into, but this meditator became the object of animosity for this, uh, the king of Kali, this uh, king of Kalinga. This king was known to be a very, very not nice person. And the story is, is that this king, the king of Kalinga, got very upset with the, this meditator. And basically proceeded to, with a sword, proceeded to eviscerate and cut limb by limb, finger by finger, nose and ears, and proceeded to slice this ascetic to pieces. The Buddha, before he was the Buddha. But what Kashanti was, what is Kashanti? The whole time this was happening, the Buddha in this previous life never developed animosity for this person that was doing this to them. And that was the act of Kashanti, was even not getting angry at this, actually still, even in the midst of being eviscerated limb from limb, still extending to this person loving kindness and compassion for their ignorance and delusion, even in that state. And that speaks to that anecdote, that Jataka tale. It speaks to two things. It speaks to the overwhelming kindness and compassion that even the Buddha had in a previous life. You know, we, we, we celebrate this sage, this bodhisattva Jesus for this saying of, you know, love your neighbors yourself and turn the other cheek and all of that. It's the same idea that is captured in this Jataka tale, which is that even to this horrendous person, the Buddha was still extending loving kindness and compassion. That's one thing. The second thing, though, that speaks to immovability is that the Buddha was not moved towards anger. <clears throat> was not, in, in other words, if the Buddha was say at that moment, and he wasn't the Buddha, right? So he was this wandering ascetic. And the idea is, is that in that moment, if the Buddha, that ascetic, was in a samadhi, in a deep meditative state, the idea is, is that they never came out of it. So they remained immovable in the face of this animosity. So again, it's sort of twofold. One is like, wow, he, like even being kind towards this person. But the other one is this immovable position. And I would suggest that you think about that immovable position as it pertains to fear and how fear pertains to clinging to life desperately. And this wandering ascetic had all, in fact, if you read all the Jataka tales kind of in order 
from when the Buddha was a, a plant all the way up through lifetimes as a giraffe and a deer and lions. And then as wandering ascetic after wandering ascetic after wandering ascetic after wandering ascetic, the idea is, is that the Buddha at this point had reached this stage of long ago, not, um, not being afraid in that way. And I just want to kind of point out that aspect of immovability. It actually, for me personally, this is an interpretation, by the way, but immovability has a lot to do with fear in that sense. And being immovable would be kind of equivalent to being fearless in that sense. So that's the, the samadhi of this third stage. Now, the more philosophical aspect of immovability, the more philosophical side of this third samadhi, well, it has to do with a more, um, let's see, how, A, how much time do we have? Okay, B, um, I'll, let me just do it this way. There's much, um, there's much deeper ideas here that I'm not going to do. Um, cause yeah, it would just derail this too, a little too much, but so I'll give it to you simply. The idea here is, is this, so I'm, I'm over, I'm over here on this side of the screen, right? And so I might move <laughs> over to this side of the screen. So I have moved, I'm over here now, hi, right? So the idea is, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hope that you remember my opening remarks regarding samadhi as being beyond the subject object relationship and non-dual in that way. Well, <laughs> the idea of course of being over here and not being over there is an aspect of subject object relationship in that way. And so I could go back over here and, and move, and that required movement. And the reason why it requires Michael movement to go from here to here is because Michael is over here. And I, Michael, understand myself to be here and not over there. But the idea is, is that if I really did <clears throat> go through that process of letting go of the past and the future, letting go of that which is not in my purview, putting aside the emotional layers to this, and then even going through the realm of pure form and arriving at a non-dual state beyond subject and object, well, there's something interesting that could happen in that state, which is that there is no here and there. In fact, if I understand my equanimity and all of this and, and dissolution of subject object properly, if I understand that all properly, if there were an actual dissolution of subject object, then here would be there. Here would already be there. There would already be here. And the only way here isn't there is because I'm trapped in this subject object relationship. Are you following me on that philosophical way of thinking about immovability? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Great. That means we get to do another samadhi because we understand now third level, by the way, the third stage, right? So the third stage here is the Prabhakari, the light maker, this idea of uh, like refulgent, this idea of like beaming. That's the third stage. And you get to be beaming and refulgent upon practicing Kashanti. 
And by making the initial determination for enlightenment by way of the third paramita of Kashanti, one attains this immovable samadhi. One step up from that, making the fourth generation, the paramita, the practice that the bodhisattva works on, let's say, during this fourth stage to bring them through this fourth initiation of enlightenment, the fourth paramita is virya. Determination, drive, I like drive, I like the idea of being driven. Um, the reason why I like drive and being driven is a lot about virya. Virya, you know, it's this energy. It's, it's, it's get up and go. <laughs> like that phrase, get up and go, that's virya. And so it is virya, this fourth paramita, this fourth stage, it's about non-laziness. It's about non-torpor. It's about, you know, again, get up and go. But it's also, this is why I like drive as a translation for virya. Virya is also, it is an answer to this question that I often receive as a Dharma teacher, which is, isn't wanting enlightenment a desire? And isn't desire the problem? And the answer is yes. <laughs> you are right, Bodhisattva, good Bodhisattva. <laughs> that is exactly right. If you want it and desire it, then it, then even if it's enlightenment, it's 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 just as bad as anything else that would be wanted or desired in that way, especially if you want or, or desire it because you think it'll make you cooler or better or more popular at parties, right? So the idea is, is that if you have set this up as a goal, as, an, as, a, as a trophy, as a reward, as a desire attainable, yeah, then it doesn't even matter if it's enlightenment. It's, it's equally problematic in that way. So the answer is, well, but then why, why then body? So then what does a bodhisattva do? Because they don't want to want it. They don't want to desire it. And the answer is bodhisattvas pursue enlightenment because they are driven to pursue enlightenment. They couldn't imagine not pursuing enlightenment. It's not something they want to do or desire to do. They are driven to do it. And I like, I feel like in my own life, I know what it feels like to be driven to do something. And for me personally, that's a great place to be in. It, it, it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's, it screams purpose, all kinds of things. It's, and it's, it's not a desire. It's not cravy in that way. So the fourth paramita is this drive determination. And this is the paramita that is part of this fourth generation of enlightenment. And the bodhisattva who makes this fourth determination for enlightenment by practicing determination or drive or virya will attain this samadhi that is the non-regressing samadhi. So the non-regressing samadhi, not recoiling, not sliding down the hill, not uh, taking steps backwards, but the non-regressing samadhi. Yeah. So this is, this is a, um, although it's not one of the 10 stages, there is one of the stages, I think it's somewhere around the, fifth or sixth stage. I'm not exactly sure. I really should memorize this because I'm, I'm, I'm never getting this right. But the Bodhisattva in practicing the Bodhisattva path starts to go through the stages. And there's an idea 
that the bodhisattva could be a first stage bodhisattva and go up to the second stage, but then drop back down to the first stage and go to the second stage and the third stage, but drop back down to the second stage, but then get keep going, but then go back. But there is an idea, and this is where I should really get my facts straight, so I apologize, but there reaches a point where the bodhisattva becomes a non-regressing bodhisattva. They're, they're no longer making any movements backwards. It's all towards enlightenment at this point. So they're a non-regressing bodhisattva. But there's also wrapped up into this idea of non-regression. I already mentioned it uh, quickly. It's this idea of not recoiling. So part of the idea of non-regression is not recoiling, but actually um, Oops. continuing on. <laughs> yeah, Connie. Nope. Everybody good? So, yeah, Tanya. So non-regressing, is that the same as a stream enterer? Well, that's a big, huge question. That's a big, huge, crazy question. So what Tanya just asked, and it's a really great question. What Tanya just asked was, oh, non-regression, is that the stage of the stream enterer? And what Tanya is referencing are what are called the four fruits, the four fruits of practice, the four fruits of Buddhism. And these four fruits are called the stage, the stage of the stream enterer, the stream of the once returner, the stream of the non returner, and then finally the arahat, the worthy one, sometimes just translated as the saint, right? So that those four stages were the old school, original Buddhist uh, schema for cultivation and progress <clears throat> that upon the initial kind of, you, you basically hear about the Dharma. In some schools, you actually have to have a conception or an understanding of no self. In other schools, it's just like you hear about the Dharma and you're like, that sounds better than this craziness. <laughs> that sounds better than this. Sign me up. That's called a stream enterer. But again, some in some schools, you actually have to have an insight regarding no self to be a stream enterer. There's other ways of dividing this too. But the next stage is the stage of the once returner and non returner. That actually traditionally refers to rebirth. One more rebirth. You, you'll, you will be reborn one more time as a human, but then you will get totally enlightened nirvana. Or the next stage, the third stage, the third fruit is the stage of the non-returner, which means you are done being reborn, but you will pass away out of this body, be reborn in a heavenly realm, and up there, you will finish your practice and attain nirvana. Or fourth stage, arhat, you've attained nirvana here and now in this world. And you're a saint, you're a worthy one. So those are the four fruits. Those are the traditional four stages of enlightenment in Buddhism. And the reason why Tanya's question is a great question is because these 10 stages are very much in conversation with those four original stages. The interesting thing about it, if you want to get Dharma about it, is that that initial one, once returner, non-returner, it's all about this idea of being reborn. The bodhisattva is in the back of the room raising their question, raising their hand for like all the class. They're like, and then finally at the end of the class, 
They call in the Bodhisattva and the Bodhisattva is like, but I thought there's no self. I didn't think there was any. <laughs> I, what gets reborn one more time? What gets not reborn anymore? And I, I'm, I'm joking, but indeed, this, these 10 stages, this whole Bodhisattva path is based on that which is, oh yeah, let's not talk about being a soul being reborn anymore. Because didn't the Buddha say that's not true? Didn't the Buddha say that it's the illusion or the delusion of that that's causing all the problem? So why do we have this schema that's all about, oh, oh congratulations, you're only going to be reborn one more time. Now, I don't want to throw it totally under the bus because I do think that in the original practice of this, it was actually about how close you were to fully understanding that there is no self. Do you, is it only going to take you another week to figure this out? <laughs> it might take you another year to figure this out. So again, I don't want to throw that original schema entirely under the bus because I do think they were talking about the same thing. But like a lot of Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism sort of lets go of a, a lot of aspects of early Buddhism. And so one of the things that the Mahayana tradition lets go of is the whole language of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, and in particular, arhat. And I've said this before too, in the early Buddhist tradition, <clears throat> if you made it to the highest level, you were an arhat. But the word arhat means worthy one. And what worthy means is worthy of offerings. And the idea is, is that in that early Buddhist tradition, an arhat was a purified being glowing uh the the just the i mean glorious and so if you gave some food to an arhat or you gave some cloth to an arhat or shelter to an arhat oh my gosh the amount of merit the amount of brownie points that you would get from making offerings to an arhat insane From a Mahayana point of view, that's ass backwards. <laughs> the arhat needs to be king giver, not king receiver. And I just, you know, I, again, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus or anything under the bus. The early Buddhist tradition was this forest dwelling, renunciatory, deep monastic path. They survived on, on people giving them food to survive. And so the whole schema of an arhat being super worthy of offerings and all of that, I get it. It's just, I'm super into the Mahayana tradition and I am basically a Mahayana Buddhist in that way because of the reversal of roles about giving. In the Mahayana tradition, bodhisattvas are, they practice giving they do not practice getting. And I'm not saying arhats are in the business of practicing getting, but the, re the lived reality is that they were in the business of practicing getting. And I think the Mahayana tradition was like, yeah, let's, let's abandon that whole rebirth schema, once returner, non-returner, and let's abandon the whole arhat idea. So... So, Tanya, once returner, non returner, stream enter does not come into this. But the, your thinking, though, is right on point because stream enterer is making the initial determination for enlightenment. Oh, and by the way, I can't have, I definitely cannot give that Dharma talk on that, on that, what I just said. Um, without giving credit where credit is due. So if you were to go to, let's see, I think it's chapter, 
I, I won't find the exact chapter, but there is one chapter in the Diamond Sutra, properly translated as the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. But the Vajra Sutra, there's one chapter in it that discusses the stream enterer, the once returner, the non returner, and the arhat. Very, very important chapter of the Vajra Sutra. And it's a very, very important introduction to Mahayana Buddhism, frankly, because in that chapter, the exchange between the Buddha and Shibuti is, it goes something like this. Stream enterer, there is no stream. There's nothing to enter. Understanding that there is no stream and that there is nowhere to enter that's being a stream enterer. And that's a beautiful Mahayana twist on old school Buddhism. And I, that chapter of the Vajra Sutra is really important. I think it goes overlooked a lot because it's, it's, it's doing what I just said, which is revamping that original schema. And it's kind of making fun of it. It, it actually says, since there's nobody to be reborn, that's like the person who realizes there's nobody to be reborn, that's a non-returner. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> the Vajra Sutra is very funny. So, so that's that. I hope that's been a good answer to your question, Tanya, because it really was a great, uh, I hadn't mentioned that at all. Um, so, okay. And I just have just enough time to give you my awesome, fun, analogy for the non-regressing samadhi. <laughs> so this is sort of, it's a, like a more of a thought experiment. It's a, yeah, it's something to just kind of leave you with tonight to get you, you know, thinking about all how all of this might fit together. And so this non-regressing samadhi, there's something that comes to my mind and I, again, this is sort of just fun. So this is a total Upaya, uh, a Michael Upaya. This is obviously not going to come from any Sutra, but it's an interesting thing to think about. So I remember when I was young, um, I don't know how old I would have been when I started started getting into this stuff, but I was, I was kind of a nerdy kid in that way, really into science and stuff. And I remember when, as a, 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 a young person being very into the speed of light, you know, Einstein and all of that, but in particular, the idea of the speed of light, right? Like that, that idea always really intrigued me. And I remember sort of having a, I wouldn't, go so far as to call it a realization or anything like that. Not as not anything near as profound as a realization. But I kind of remember having and I don't know if this was something I just thought of, or it was something like my my father maybe suggested to me to think about. But and and I don't know if I'll do a great job of it, but I want to try. And it was it was about how I, it was this idea that if, if, if something was moving at the speed of light, there would be no time. And the way that I conceived of that as a young person was, and this is not Buddhist, by the way, this is, again, is just totally like Michael is a little kid tripping out. So don't, don't take it as anything other than that. Um, in particular, because I'm about to talk about some Western science ideas that don't entirely cooperate with Buddhism. But the idea is, is that the way that I imagine this as a kid is if I had whatever object, right? So my pencil. And the idea was, is that the light is coming from the various light sources and bouncing off and hitting my retina. And that's how I see the object. And of course, a new photon or a series of photons are coming and bouncing off of it. And so I see the pencil, but I see it as it is now, 
not as it was a second ago because I'm getting these photons, right? But then I, as a kid, I was like, oh, so if there's these photons and they come and they hit the pencil and they bounce off and they're coming at my retina, what if I jumped on one of those light beams and went pew and went shooting off with it at the speed of light? What I realized is, oh, then the image of that pencil in that particular moment as those photonic light wave particles, whatever, bounced off of it, if instead of just passively receiving them and receiving the next ones and receiving the next ones, if I jumped on the tips of those light beams and started riding them out to space, this would be stuck in time because I would actually be stuck with the light, the photonic light of it at that moment. And I would be now traveling at the same speed as that light and going off with it to infinity and beyond. And I would not, I wouldn't be here to get the next series of photons to see how the pencil looked a second later or a second later or a second later, because I'm off with it at that moment. Everybody with me on that crazy idea, right? I think that in terms of trying to mesh together equanimity, oneness, samadhi, and all of that, and in particular, this idea of non-regressing. Because if you are at the tips of, or non-regressing, right? So if you're at the tips of those light beams, you're full speed ahead. <laughs> You are not going back at all. You are in time. You are in step with the present moment and moving entirely forward with it. My mind is not in the past at all. I am only present and forward. That might be a way of thinking about non-regression in terms of the Bodhisattva path, which is full speed ahead, we are not going back, but also this sort of like, I guess what I wanted to try to do with that analogy was mash together a sense of momentum, a sense of forward energy and equanimity by the stillness in that analogy I gave you that if I jumped on all of the photons right here and said, bye everybody, I'm going with this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with this forward, there would be a kind of extreme equanimity to that, right? Because it would be this sort of stillness in, in continuous forward progression. Again, I'm not saying that the Bodhisattva is riding light beams. It's not what I'm saying. I was trying to create an interesting mind thought experiment that would give you a feeling of momentum, forward momentum, and equanimity. And that's the best I came up with. <laughs> wow. wow. Okay, so four samadhis down. Do we do the other six next time? We do the other six next time. Yeah. So we're going to do one more night on Samadhi. We're going to do one more night on Samadhi next Sunday. And we're going to finish off these Samadhis because we got to talk about the, the top one, the Shurangama Samadhi. We've got to talk about that. So stay tuned till next week for that. And uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love the hearts. <laughs>